Our speaker this afternoon is Mr. Humphrey Hawksley, who is a correspondent for BBC. Mr. Hawksley's assignments have taken him to all continents of the world, including opening the BBC's television bureau in China, to being expelled from Sri Lanka and being arrested in Serbia. His work has appeared in many leading news media, including the Financial Times, New York Times, and the Globe and Mail. Mr. Hawksley is the author of numerous books. His latest one is on Asian waters, the struggle over the Asia Pacific, and and the strategy of Chinese expansion. Copies of his book are available outside of the room. Mr. Hawksley's presentation will be followed by question and answer period. Without further ado, I'll turn the podium to Humphrey. Thank you. One, two. Um, I'm not sure if I need this, but I'll keep it for a little bit, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the struggle over the South China Sea and the strategy of Chinese expansion, but I, the story is shifting all the time. So I'm going to give you the background of what I've done, but we're going to try and piece together what is happening. So we've got a trade war going on at the moment. We've had a skirmish between the Chinese and the US Navy just last week in the South China Sea, and we've got recently all sorts of smaller Asian countries uh, hitting back, as it were, against the Chinese expansion. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is weave that in, the, the news headlines in, essentially to some of the history and the politics that surrounds it. Uh, one of the most... Um, interesting things that happened as this book was about to be published is that I got a call from the UK publisher uh, which has a cover like this and he said uh, Humphrey we've got a problem the export teams in Southeast Asia will not sell a book with South China Sea in the title this is the US version and it says the struggle over the South China Sea and the strategy of Chinese expansion the sales teams in Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia would not want to sell that book. These are the young people that go out, mid-twenties and whatever. Stuff is moving. So we had to change. This is the UK export title, The Struggle Over the Asia-Pacific and the Strategy of Chinese Expansion, which, of course, is now, since Trump visited, called the Indo-Pacific. So these are the things that we're weaving into it. <clears throat> now... I thought I'd begin with this picture that might be familiar to many of you of the Korean Peninsula. And the Korean Peninsula divided between north and south. You've got the blackness of the north, where there's no electricity and it's a dictatorship, and the light of the south, which is a market economy and a democracy, mentored in by the US. I begin with it because, partly because the Korean Peninsula has been very much in the news in the Asia Pacific recently, but also because there's this black and whiteness that we get, particularly on US led political things overseas, where you have the good and the bad. You have good against evil. You have Clint Eastwood going into the town and killing the bad guys and then walking off into the sunset. And this is different from what we have in Europe now and in Asia. And I got this when I was talking to a senator about a different issue, it was actually about Iran. But I said, look, you know, if we have this Iran deal, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, we can have a win-win situation. And he comes back to me, he says, Humphrey, you don't understand how we work. Here in the States, we need a win-lose situation. And that sort of brought home to me of what we're up against. So in in the US view of the Korean Peninsula, the US view of a lot of Asia, uh, and particularly because is that you've got the good and the bad guy thing. So the bad and the evil is in the north, and the good is in the south. And again, when you see things from the US point of view, issues are personalized. So those of you that might be of my generation, we remember how bad Saddam was. We remember how bad Gaddafi of Libya was. We remember how bad Assad is. And we remember that North, the whole of North Korea is encapsulated in a guy that's become known as Little Rocket Man, um, uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, and the idea is, is that if you can actually get this man to become, either to leave or to become a Democrat, a panoply of good things will come down 
and it will fix. It doesn't actually quite work like that, but that's the sort of narrative that comes out of Washington on the 24-hour news cycles uh, that, we often, um, uh, that, that often encapsulates a crisis. Uh, I've been to, have any of you guys been to North Korea? One, okay. Uh, two, brilliant. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. Uh, the once I went there, uh, the first time I went there was um, as an undercover reporter, so I was there as a tourist. Um, and uh, we were filming sort of through handbags and through our glasses and pens in our pockets and all that sort of stuff. And um, we had a great day out with the North Korean guides. And those of you that have been there will know that these people are intelligent and they're witty and you can joke and jest with them a bit uh, as long as you stay within these parameters. So we had a fantastic day where we went to a maternity hospital where there were no babies and no mothers, <laughs> just people in white coats. We went to the Model Star Farm where as far as I could make out, there were no animals and no agricultural produce. Uh, I went to pick up something that I thought was an apple, and it turned out to be plastic. Um, but we didn't say anything, we just looked at it. We went to a, a martial arts place, I don't know whether you, you were taken there, where they sort of, these guys crack a wall in half uh, in seconds, and you think you wouldn't like to meet them on a dark night. And then we end up here, which to those of you who know North Korea, is the Juche Tower which I think is just a few feet higher than the Washington National Monument, to make a point. Uh, and the Juche Tower encapsulates the Juche ideology. The Juche ideology is one of self-reliance, which is why North Korea is the happiest, most successful, richest, and most prosperous country in the world, according to the great leaders there. And we were there at the end of the day, and the darkness, as you saw in that picture was pretty much complete, apart from a huge moon that was hanging down. So I said, in a relaxed way, I said, that's a beautiful moon. And the guide says, yes, you could almost reach out and touch it. And I say, yes, and to think that a man has walked on the moon. And suddenly you could cut that atmosphere with a machete, because I'd stepped over the mark. And he says to me, uh, Mr. Humphrey, no man has walked on the moon. And I say, oh, really? He says, no, because our great leader, Kim Il-sung, will be the first to send a spaceship to the moon. So I stop, and you realize that there are actually situations that you don't want to push the boundaries. So we went back and had a beer and cracked some jokes, and the atmosphere was a little chilly, and it wasn't all right. But, uh, and then we went. We weren't arrested. And a few years later, I was trying to get into North Korea again. And in, in Britain, they have an embassy, which is actually a suburban house, uh, not very big, on a huge, huge expressway that loops around London. And uh, I'd written out a letter, and I had a name card that came from a, a, a senior North Korean official to say what a brilliant person I was and everything. So I go there, and ring the gate bell, a guy comes out, I hand him the letter, he stands there and reads the letter. And he says, um, he says, okay, uh, thank you, uh, we'll get back to you. And I said, well, hold on a second, can I have a visa form or something? He reads the letter again, standing in front of me, and his lip begins to twitch a bit. And uh, he then he says, thank you, we'll get back to you. And I say, well, at least tell me your name or something. And he points up like that, and he says, my name is Moon, like what is up there. And then he smiles, and he says, you don't remember me, do you? And this was the guide that had pulled me up. <laughs> and he says, Mr. Humphrey, you will be the first one to visit North Korea after we have put a spaceship on the moon. <laughs> so that's the Korean Peninsula. It's not... You know, there's a, there's a threat of nuclear war. We all know about that. But there are nuances, and there are, there's humanity there. And that's what we, we have to remember on that. And some of these issues that are coming up that, that, that are the background of what we've got the Sino-US trade war at the moment, where you have a, big companies working in China that are thinking of moving out of China to somewhere else. And we have to think a little bit about how long China can sustain that uh, when you have people dumping... Uh, their investments in Apple and going to Samsung in Vietnam, because Vietnam's a, 
a safer place to go in. And we have this discrepancy. I wouldn't take any notice academically of this chart. It's just an idea to show the sort of detail that's being put in on, on, the, on the trade stuff uh, that's going in the computer and electronics. This is the trade and balances. And then we have American warships going into the South China Sea. And when you have stuff about trade happening and you have warships and those two are going bad, you have not got a good situation. And when we have so much of our economies and business uh, and commercial enterprises tied up with Asia and China, you've got an even worse situation. And, uh, and part of the work that I've been doing is try to explain this to, to a wider audience, not just to sort of uh, a, a smaller audience. This is the Indo-Pacific. And this is what Donald Trump, when he went there about a year ago, couched as his new sort of interest area in Asia. And within the Indo-Pacific, there are, uh, are five triggers that uh, I've, I've identified, others might identify more. We've dealt with the Korean Peninsula. And then if you go just uh, east of there, you've got the Japan, Sino-Japan relationship, which is not good. You've got the China-India relationship, which on the border there, where you see Nepal and Bhutan, is constantly fractious. You've got the Taiwan-China relationship, which is getting worse and worse by the day as China clamps down on Taiwan's democracy and quasi-independence. And then you have the South China Sea itself, which is the, I don't know what you call it, the sort of red line, the, 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 the battleground, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to say, because that is where just two or three days ago, down in the Spratly Islands, which you can see down there, uh, that is where a US warship and a Chinese warship came like this and they had to avoid each other. The, the, when I was researching this book, the one phrase that came on my mind from military people was the, the risk of miscalculation is high. And we have to think what happened if those two ships actually hit each other in the mood that China's in at the moment, the mood that America's in at the moment. Now, <clears throat> the line that you see around there, and forgive me for those of you that know this well, is called the Nine Dash Line. And locally it's called the Cow's Tongue, because you can see how it sort of hangs out of the mouth of the Northeast like a cow's tongue. Very graphic, you can understand it. Inside this area is what China claims to be its sovereign national territory. But you can see by the map itself that, you know, it's close to the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and China. If you even take Hainan Island, is, is miles away from all that. And there are four strategic elements within this. You have the Spratly Islands, uh, where there was that confrontation uh, a couple of days ago where in the past five to six years, China has built seven military bases out of rocks, reefs, and reclaimed land. Up to the north there, you have the Paracel Islands, which China took from Vietnam on two occasions. One was in 1956, and the other one took half of it then, and the other one was in 1974. Now, those historians amongst us that have got an idea of Asian history is that 1956, Vietnam had just come out of kicking out the French at Dien Bien Phu and was bracing itself for the big war against the US. So its mind wasn't on some islands in the middle of the South China Sea. 1976, they were about to, 74, they were about to win that war because the Saigon fell in 1975. Again, their mind wasn't on this. And China went in and China now controls those islands. Now, if you track the uh, ships from Singapore that go through that shipping lane, and you see how they have to pass by the Spratly Islands and the Paracel Islands. So you've got basically a strait there where you have Chinese warplanes, missile ships, whatever you want to say, that control that area. Now, the Americans can send in their carrier groups, but they're not based there. Um, there's no reason that China would disrupt those shipping lanes. In fact, it would be really against their interest because they need the oil and supplies that come in. But that's different from actually having control. Uh, you have Scarborough Shoal, which I'll touch on in a moment, off the Philippines, which is now controlled by China, but not, nothing's built there. And Dongshar Island, which I'll come to at the end, which is, um, uh, which is controlled by 
Taiwan. So this is the battleground of the South China Sea. As if you read the story of two days ago, you can actually see what was happening. The US was carrying out a freedom of navigation operation around one of the bases, going within 12 nautical miles of where it, um, uh, of, of, of what is it, un, under, under nautical law, maritime law, you have 12 nautical miles of sovereign territory and 200 miles of an exclusive economic zone. The, the US is now going within those 12 miles with warships and the Chinese challenge them. The first flagging up of this problem that I came across in, in modern history was in 1959 when Australia's Joint Intelligence Committee uh, wrote a memo to Washington and London asking them that they take control of these islands because the Chinese might uh, develop them militarily and occasionally have the ability to shoot down aircraft. That was in 1959. Nothing happened because other stuff was going on in the world. There was Cuba, there was, there was um, Suez for Britain and all the rest of it, and, and nothing happened. And then in 2012, this is a place called Mischief Reef. Oh, sorry, I've, I've done something. This, this picture here was 1995, when I did my first television report on this. And this is when fishing uh, shelters, the Chinese call them, came up on Mischief Reef, which is technically owned by the Philippines. Nobody did anything. You can see in this blurry photograph the flag, uh, the Chinese flag up there. We got one piece on our main evening news, and that was it, because they were built and then nothing happened. And nothing happened for a long time. This is Mischief Reef in 2012. You can't see those shelters, but basically there's not much going on. 2012, when Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, came to power and uh, stuff began to happen, the, the, the US had announced its pivot to Asia uh, and all the rest of it. Five years later, this is the same reef. And there you have radars, hangars, mobile missile shelters, and a runway. Seven of those have been built, varying different degrees, uh, in the Spratly Islands. Going back up to the Paracel Islands, which is disputed with Vietnam, uh, again, there was always a base of some sort there. This is a runway. Uh, it's been there for years, old Japanese uh, base. Uh, this is 2012. Again, 2017, you can see how the runway's been extended. You've got the missile, um, mobile missile launchers, hangars. You've got all the concepts there of the military base on place called Woody Island. And here it is with two aircraft there uh, about a year ago. There have been other pictures since military aircraft on Woody Island to show the capacity that they've got there. Why is China doing it? This is what it's doing. And why is it doing it? Two things have happened in the, um, in, 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 in the past five years. One is that China has been taken to an international tribunal by the Philippines to check whether this is legal or not. And this tribunal found that what it was doing was illegal under international law. But China didn't say, well, I'm sorry, we got it wrong, you caught us out, we'll take it all down. It kept reinforcing what was there. The problem or conundrum that we in the West have on this, or anybody has, is that if international law can be so blatantly ignored in the South China Sea, what will happen as China extends into Latin America, Africa, Europe, the rest of it, which it inevitably will do? And what would happen if any other country, including my country, including the US, Canada, Iran, or Russia do, citing this as a precedent of what to do? What do we do about it? What does international law mean when you're doing business and when you're doing trade and when you're, you're, you, you need the, 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 the maritime transport to go backwards and forwards? You know, we, we, we need to ascertain that. And then this is the question, the why is China doing it? Because China has benefited more than any other country I can think of since it joined the WTO in 2001. By selling to Europe, by selling to US, by using international law and its trade, why is it bucking it here? This is the big question. <clears throat> this partly answers it because it's emotional. 
it's led, it, it, it's a mythology or a legend that is uh, that is given to every school child as soon as they're like this, and it's called China's Century of Humiliation. Uh, what I'm about to tell you, when I say it, is often torn apart by academics and experts that say I have this wrong and that wrong, and it didn't happen like this and that. But that's not the point. The point is that this is believed, more or less, by 1.2 billion people. And let's say a billion of them don't believe it, and there are arguments at the top as to how far they should go with it or not. That's the majority of people believe this, this story. So the school children said, never forget national humiliation, and the years run from 1839, which was the start of something called the Opium War by Britain, to 1949, which was when Mao Zedong came to power and threw out the pro-American nationalist government. The Opium War was essentially Britain wanting to sell opium to China to balance the books of a multinational company, let's call it that, the East India Company, in South Asia. They needed to sell their opium somewhere. China was the best market. The Chinese government said, we, we're not going to let you do that, so they went in with gunboats to force them to do it. This is the Opium Museum in a place called Human, near Guangzhou, and that is a cannon that failed to stop those British guns going. This is the school children I spoke about that are told this story all the time. And when they walk into the museum, they don't see an old cannon or anything like that. They see that on the outside. They see this picture of a vivacious young woman who becomes addicted to opium and then eventually collapses. And when you walk through the museum, you see on one side the technology that the West had at the time in 1839, of the, the telescope, the microscope, the clocks, the books, the globe, all of that sort of thing that enabled it to crush the Chinese empire. Now on the other side, unfortunately I don't have a picture of this, there is a, a, a bucolic um, farming scene of a sort of straw hut, bullocks, crops, uh, showing that they hadn't, they had stood still for centuries, they hadn't developed as the West had. China had been left behind, and never must this be allowed to happen again. So when you go to China, you see the research and development, you look at Shanghai, you look at all that sort of stuff. This is what is in the back of their minds. We must beat everybody else at this so that we don't be humiliated again. And it was that technology that in 1839 gave Britain the discipline and the motive and the technology to beat China and invade it and basically colonize those coastal swathes. And there they are in the final uh, defeat there. So when you talk now, I've often talked to Chinese officials about the international rule of law that I mentioned about the South China Sea, and they say, well, the first element we got of that international rule of law was the barrel of a British gun trying to sell narcotics and make my country a country of drug addicts. They will use it to what they want, but they don't trust it. And they don't trust the people who run it, which is basically the West or the Bretton Woods and that sort of thing. That The Great Wall of China that we all know about, and those of you that, 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 that uh, are more familiar with this know that over the centuries, China created its... Um, uh, it's bigger wall, it's buffer state. So you have Tibet, you have Xinjiang, you have Mongolia, you have Manchuria, and these were to protect the northern borders of China. But because they fell into this corruption and weakness, they weren't able to protect the southern borders. And that is why now Xi Jinping uh, calls it the Great Wall of the Sea. In fact, I'm not sure he's actually called it that, but this is what is told to me. They are creating the Great Wall of the Sea, and nobody is going to stop them from doing that, and that is what those bases in the South China Sea represent. Very similar, in a way, to the Monroe Doctrine that the U.S. brought in in the Caribbean and Latin America in the early 19th century, although China hasn't categorized it quite as that. They've been making their point on it by initially refusing local fishermen the rights to fish there. This is a Vietnamese fisherman who was beaten up and pushed away from the Paracel Islands uh, 
up in that uh, top area of the sea. These are Filipinos trying to make a point of pushing a, putting a flag on a rock. See how ridiculous it is? I mean, who, who needs that rock, right? But you know, this, this, is, this is geopolitics we're talking about here. This is, uh, we're going across to Scarborough Shoal now, just to remind you there, opposite the Paracels, in, in the Manila's um, economic exclusion zone. This is, looks just like Mischief Reef. This is where Filipino fishermen have fished for years. And then this guy called Yurik Usen, father and grandfather fished there, and then he went up there one day and he was water cannoned by a Chinese uh, coast guard and had to go back in that rickety boat that he's got there uh, to his village called Masinlok, which is actually, uh, the, the, the Scarborough Shoal is called Masinlok in Filipino. So this is a little fishing village, and you imagine this. This guy is not allowed to fish where he used to fish, and his, and his mates there. The village survives on fishing. And what I'm about to, a little story I'm about to tell is, is tell you the way China sort of is operating throughout Southeast Asia, throughout much of the world now, is that uh, he couldn't afford to live, so he had to get a job as a seaclo driver. This is a big man, big muscles, weather-beaten face, and he's used to the waves and the tides and the fish and that. He's not a seaclo driver. He doesn't like it. Then he went to work in a shop. That didn't give him enough money, so his wife and several of the other wives there had to take jobs as domestic helpers in Saudi Arabia. The kids were being brought up by neighbors and that. Imagine a small community us here, and you have that heart ripped out of you like that. How do you feel? How does he feel as a man? How does his wife feel as a mother that can't raise her children and has to work for some dreadfully corrupt Saudi royal household? All he wants to do is fish. So President Duterte of the Philippines, the Trump-like president who had been newly elected to the Philippines, um, went to Beijing and cut a deal about many things, but included in this was that he would do this, this, and this for China, but the, the, the Scarborough Shoal fishermen must be able to fish back there again. Uh, included in that trip, he, at the end of it, he comes back and he makes a statement. He says, America has lost. Our future lies with China and not with the United States. That is a big statement for America's, one of America's hardest allies in, in the Asia Pacific. It's got a bit wobbly since then, but that was the statement. Yurik Osen was allowed to go back and fish there again, but under the watch of Chinese coast guards. So he doesn't, the Philippines has, no longer has control of Scarborough Shoal, but he can fish and that's all he wanted. He's not a geopolitical guy. He, his wife, they're making arrangements for the wife to come back, for the fish to be sold, and the village to get its life back again. So China came in, took away something, and then gave it back on its terms. This is something that is happening throughout, as I said, throughout Southeast Asia, and we're feeling it a bit in Europe at the moment, and I'm sure in Latin America, Africa, I'm not sure about here in Canada, but this is the, the, the Chinese strategy that is being felt all around the world. Vietnam. The Philippines and Vietnam are the two biggest hostile uh, governments in the South China Sea dispute. This is the Vietnam Military War Museum. Uh, which I've been to many times uh, since the late 1980s, which shows my generation, I'm afraid. But the first time I went there, you walked in and you didn't see this. You saw three armored vehicles crushed and piled on top of each other. The first one was the French, defeated at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. The second one uh, was an American, uh, defeated in Saigon in 1975. And the other one was a Chinese captured uh, in the 1979 war with China, piled on top of each other, basically saying, don't mess with us, we're Vietnam. And this is the one country that I know of, correct me if any know, that has taken on five, three of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and given them a bloody nose each time, defeated two outright and given China a bloody nose. You walk into this museum today and you see this American captured aircraft. You see to the left there, there's a French vehicle. Nothing from China. You do not see any of its conflict with China. 
you have very great detailed map about how they took Saigon in 75, the orders that were given, where the tanks were, and all the rest of it. But I went to the curator, or one of the, 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 the people, I said, well, what's going on? He says, well, we don't like to make a point of upsetting China now. It's not in our interest to do that. And then I said, really? I mean, this is part of history. He takes me upstairs, opens the door, there's a huge empty room. He says, but just in case, we're leaving a room empty. <laughs> I'm just going to quickly go through the other triggers, uh, just to, to give an idea. There's the India-China border, which some of you may recall a year ago, there was a big standoff of troops on that border, uh, um, up, near the, where, in, up near Bhutan. Uh, and this has happened periodically ever since India's independence, most notably in 1962. Uh, when because India had been supporting the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan issue, China thought, a bit like it did with Vietnam in 1979, uh, we should teach India a lesson. So in November 19, uh, is it October? Or November 1962, the Chinese went in on that, that border area. Uh, India asked and got immediate help from the US that sent military advisors, warplanes, supplies and everything. And you would think that these two great democracies would link like this, shoulder to shoulder, forever. It was proof of a great relationship happening. It was even better on the US's part because China had, had timed its invasion or incursion to go exactly with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The day that blockade began, China went in, the day it ended, China withdrew because it thought that the US would be distracted. Kennedy saw it as a sort of stopping the great global role of communism and thought otherwise and went in. And I'll tell you a story further on, actually, uh, about why, a possible story, why the Chinese withdrew so promptly. But in 1971, that shoulder to shoulder thing, nine years later, just broke apart. Because we're in South Asia, there was the War of Independence for East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, and the US sided with Pakistan. Within days of that happening, uh, the Indians signed a military agreement with the Soviet Union, and that military agreement now holds still very strong today, with Russia, of course. So India gets a majority of its arms, the bedrock of its arms, comes from Russia. So when we hear, and you'll hear in the, in the papers over, over the, you know, the coming weeks and months and years of this sort of closer relationship between India and, um, and, uh, uh, and the US, always remember it's factored in on this Russia thing. So if it comes to that either you're with us or against us thing, India is going to try to stay non-aligned, or if it comes to the crunch, it's going to probably side with Russia, because if it doesn't get its arms from Russia, where is it going to get its arms from? It doesn't trust America as an arms supplier, because if it changes its policy this way or that way, as we're beginning to know here, those arms would stop. This is the place where the, uh, the standoff is at the moment, or was last year, and there are still troops up there on this unresolved border tension. The other one, Sino-Japanese, that I mentioned as a trigger point, is down the bottom of this map, the Senkaku Daiu Islands, which look like this. Remember that thing about the Philippines putting a flag up on a rock? You've got three rocks there. Nobody lives there. Nothing happens there. You've got these two huge economies that rely on each other to lift the standard of living for their people and to become Asian powers. Yet for some reason, they decided to have a row over these islands. The best thing that the Americans could find out, found for them when they ran it, was to use them for bombing practice. It's like, you know, a couple of multi-billionaires having a fight over a cigarette butt in a trash can, really. But that is what happened. The Japanese were, somebody was going to, the, the mayor of Tokyo was going to buy the islands. Uh, the China said, no, they're ours. Uh, warships went on, radars got locked on to each other. Uh, there was a lot of high tension going on there, and these are the demonstrations that took place. We're, we're back now in 2012, so it was some time ago that took place um, against the Japanese in China. After these demonstrations, 
Chinese inward investment, uh, Japanese inward investment to China dropped by 40%. So you've got to think what is going on inside the minds or the governments of these two people that are risking their economies in order to make a point on nationalism. This is bad history. This is a number of factors that come in, but you've got to realize that uh, East Asia particularly that grew like this, the Asian miracle, the Asian tigers, there's something else attached to it there. The Taiwan issue, which, I, which is the uh, last trigger, uh, to me is the most important, and I might be wrong on this, and the most dangerous. The reason is that Taiwan is emotional. It's the motherland. It's unconquered territory. It's a democracy that proves that you can have a, a, a first world democracy working in a Chinese society. And this is what the Chinese, this is an image, this is Xiamen, the mega city of Xiamen, and this is an unconquered rock that's just a stone's throw off the coast there, that the Chinese Communist Party has failed to recover. When you talk to Chinese officials about Chinese and expansion and everything, Taiwan is right up there. They could, North Korea could do this, and India, China could do this, and the South China Sea could do that, but they cannot compromise on Taiwan because they have promised themselves and their people that they will get it back. This is the motherland. And this is how it's set. The actual islands are sort of 100 and so miles away. Uh, this is Jinmin here, which is uh, the yellow bit, uh, which, it, for some reason, Mao failed to recover it. Uh, they, there was a battle, and he lost it, and he didn't try again. And on Jinmen, they have these fascinating things. These are these poles. They have coat hangers up there. These are left over from the 1950s. And during an invasion, the Chinese paratroopers would fall onto these, and then uh, the Taiwanese troops would machine gun them. 1958, there was a huge shelling of Jinmen by, uh, by the Chinese in what the Americans thought was a precursor to an invasion. At that stage, um, the Americans moved nuclear-capable bombers up to Japan, to the Philippines, with a plan to put five nuclear strikes around Xiamen. This got out to Khrushchev, uh, who had just taken over as a Soviet leader. He sent, he sent a, a note to the US saying, any attack on China at this stage would be considered to be an attack on the, United, uh, on, on, uh, on the Soviet Union. The difference of, of that was that at that stage, the US military commanders thought that the nuclear weapon was just another weapon. It was your... Six gun with a better bullet in it. Eisenhower, who, you know, he understood that you're actually in a different world now and it had to be categorized differently. He put a stop to that. But in diplomatic circles, it was well known what the Americans were on the cusp of doing, which it's thought, again, but not proven, that that is why the Chinese backpedaled so quickly from India uh, in 1962, just four years later, because they thought that once the Cuban Missile crisis was over, they could be liable for a nuclear strike. So you see how this whole thing is sort of intermeshed here. You have East Asia, you have South Asia, you have that American sort of global view, uh, and you have all these different players. And, the, and sticking with this is Taipei, this is Taipei 101, that big tall building there, and it's now a first world economy, and it's a first world democracy mentored by the US over many, many years. Became a democracy in 1996. Um, it is dangerous on two counts. One, because of that sovereignty, emotional issue that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but secondly, because if it came, push came to shove, particularly under this administration now, uh, it would also be an emotional issue for the US. So whereas the South China Sea might be the place where they're playing little military maneuvers that could go out of hand, this is the place where it could get absolutely very serious. And I keep hearing this in diplomatic circles on all sides at the moment, uh, that Taiwan is the one to watch. 
it's not recognized. It's recognized by 17 countries. Uh, a year ago, it was recognized by, I think, 22. The Chinese have been bribing and persuading and bullying countries to withdraw their diplomatic recognition of Taiwan. No Taiwanese official is allowed to go inside the United Nations. And the foreign minister has now just come up and released something demanding that the United Nations recognize Taiwanese citizens as, as citizens of the world, as it were. You know, that they have rights. They're not excluded. This is a huge move, um, mainly because of the one China policy. So Taiwan, encouraged by the US, is challenging the one China policy. And back in 2016, I think it was, after Trump had been elected, he took a phone call from President Chai, again, breaking all diplomatic protocol. And at the end of that protocol, at the end of that phone call, when he was told that he was doing this wrong and that wrong and that wrong, which you got used to that now, uh, he said, so what is this one China policy? Why are we sticking to it? What does it mean? And you could believe me, the, the, you know, the diplomats and the, everybody went scrabbling for their books to write out what it was and why they had to keep it, because if you ripped that apart, uh, nobody quite knew what would happen. I just want to finish up the top there. We did the Scarborough Shoal, the Dongshire Island. Now, if you imagine that cow's tongue that, that I looked at, we haven't quite got the ships going up there. They go through the Paracels of Spratlys down there, Scarborough Shoal. You can see how strategic that is. If you have that, then you really do have that whole shipping route to yourselves. And we went there a few years back. This is us flying into Dongshar Island, uh, courtesy of the Taiwanese. That's me on the runway doing a two-way with BBC, uh, whereby it had just come off a, a story about Syria. So there'd been some dreadful thing going on in Syria. And the presenter came over to me and said, the anchor came around to me and said, and, and Humphrey, I gather there's problems in Asia as well. <laughs> the first thing I had to say was, yeah, but it, this is not the Middle East. This is not car bombs. This is not terrorism. These are big, big governments with big ideas and big bureaucracies sorting out the future. It's a whole different ball game. Not quite so exciting, perhaps, but there it is. And that's us. It, it, the Dongshar Island is run by the Coast Guard, but this guy in the middle uh, was the boss, and he was a very special forces type of Coast Guard. You know, I wouldn't like to meet him on a dark night either. And if you look at the top of that white building there uh, near the minibus, that's a bit of heavy weaponry, uh, and there's stuff kept in that cylindric building there uh, that they would do. But having said that, when I was in Taipei and I was talking to one defense official, I said, what would you do if you were in Beijing to teach Chi uh, Taiwan a lesson? He said, I would take Dongsha Island. Because by the time on a 24-hour news cycle you've explained where it is and what the issue is, you've gone on to the sports, haven't you, and the weather. So, and nobody, nobody lives here. There's no burning villages and, 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 and uh, you know, bloodshed in that. It's just Chinese tanks rolling down a, an island that nobody quite understands. So that's the one that they reckon they would go for. There's this thing, as I sort of draw all that to a close, as to why, given everything that's going on, would anybody sort of want to do this? We've talked about China a bit, the China-Japan thing. Why? Everything's going so well. But here you've got a US warship heading for the South China Sea deliberately to, you know, the showdown with the Chinese that have deliberately broken international law to build this thing that they see as the security for their supply chains and everything. And you have a, a thing in, in military strategic circles called the black swan. And the black swan is something that happens, bad thing that happens, despite all the planning that's done and all the intelligent stuff and everything that's going on. So 9-11 um, was a black swan. The, coming, the, the breaking down of the Berlin Wall was a black swan, although it was a positive one. Nobody had really predicted it, 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 it would happen at such a time. Pearl Harbor was apparently a black swan. I don't quite know how that is, but they called it a black swan. And I was in Baghdad with the US military when they told me at some, there was a car bomb that had gone off, and they, they, they described the insurgency as a black swan. 
Whereas I think anybody that had Googled the Middle East would have been able to anticipate what might have happened there. But I just leave you with this thought, is that this is the map that we began with. This is my five black swans. Um, we know about them. So if anybody, after one of them breaks out, tries to call them a black swan, tell them that, no, we knew about it, we just didn't do anything about it. And I was doing the, the, this um, a version of this last week, and the head of the former head of the British intelligence services was there, and he said he wouldn't call them black swans. He called them the black elephants in the room. <laughs> the things that nobody ever talks about. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy. I was brought up in the British colony of Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, 1957, uh, I was entering high school. And my teacher gave me exactly that lecture. He said, never forget about the 200 years of humiliation. In 57. 57. In Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Right under British administration. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and that happened because China forget about science and management. So he told all of us, if any one of you are worth it, you will have to go into science and management. And so if you look at all the students coming out to UK, coming out to North America, if they are top students, they go to science and management. That is ingrained in our brains at about a 200 years of humiliation. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Nancy. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, right now, imagine China sent a warship to um, close to uh, the shore near America. What would America do? They would send another warship to at least to try to drive away the, the Chinese warship, right? So right now, when you talk about the Americans trying to send warships in the South China Sea, and do you expect China to do nothing? Do you think this is not because China did something wrong, but it's because the U.S. is doing something to make the situation worse. And also I have another question about the, the map in the uh, South China Sea, the, the nine dashed line. Before the Communist Party took over, is, um, when the Nationalist Party has a very good relationship with America, they recognized this map. They drew the map saying this, is, uh, uh, this belongs to China. But after the Communist Party took over, they say no, um, China, uh, this part of the uh, ocean doesn't belong to China. To me, it seems that it, there's always double standards. If you are my friends, I recognize it. If you are my enemy, no, we will say, we will deny the fact. I'm not saying that what China has done is right. What I'm trying to say is, um, if there's double standards, and look at what the American has done in Iraq, they say you have chemical weapons, we invaded Iraq because of that. And afterwards, they say, oh, oops, we made a mistake. But imagine it is not America, but Russia or China who did these things. They will get sanctions or even worse situations, right? If the whole world is giving up blind, I don't know, they don't stand, uh, stand up for fairness or justice, then China would say, okay, only military power speaks out. Nobody would follow international laws. As long as you are powerful enough, nobody dare to do anything to you, right? Okay. I'm not saying what China has done is right. What I'm trying to say, all the Western countries, they are so silent about what the Americans have done wrong. And this will give other countries a wrong signal. Okay, we ha the only okay. way to be powerful is to develop uh, militarily. No, I, I yeah. get your point, and I want, I want to address it directly because you've actually come forward with the viewpoint that I was putting forward or trying to put forward there. I mean, you are accepting 
that this nine dash line and what's in it is Chinese sovereign territory? No, I'm not. Okay. So the point, your first point there is that about the warships is a very valid one because the Russians are sending their aircraft carrier through the English Channel all the time, and part of that is to test us. And the Chinese send their submarines to the coast off uh, Californian coast that has happened. The key element here is about international law. So you're quite right about the maps and all the rest of it. There's a lot of academic debate on that, but the latest benchmark we've had on this is the uh, 2016 Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling, which ruled on the universe, <clears throat> on the, the, the United Nations law of, Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, that, that what China has done here w was illegal under UNCLOS. So that's the benchmark by which we're operating on here. Um, so I think that your comparison about them sending these warships to, uh, to, to the coast of, of, of America, if those ships went inside the 12-mile line there, yes, there would be an incident. But they go inside the 12-mile line from these rocks and reefs, I told you, because they're not recognized under international law of belonging to China. So this is the key element you're making. But the other point you make, which, which is a wider one, really, is that you clearly you know, and China doesn't trust the arbiters of international law. And nor does Russia. And nor does a lot of the developing world, because exactly as you say, this, this international law was created out of the United Nations and Bretton Woods and various treaties after the Second World War. The victors of the Second World War was the United States and Britain and, and, and Europe. So it's a Eurocentric version of international law. And that's what's being challenged all around the world at the moment. Uh, because the, and, and, and the, the mechanism of changing it is locked. You have five permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, of which two are, we can say, you know, non-democratic powers, and three of them are, uh, are sort of allies. France, I mean, uh, China and Russia are on one side, and France, Britain, and the US on the other, although the US is all over the place at the moment. But the key element here is that you cannot reform international law whilst you have that system going on, because anybody that wants to reform it in or out of their favor is going to get a veto from the council. So you have a problem there. You have a huge problem of lack of, tr sorry, lack of trust and inability to reform. And at some stage, this is why I think that Either you sit down and negotiate it, understanding that you're going to concede stuff that you might not lose on the battlefield, or you're going to go to the battlefield. Um, and just, to, just on one other point on the, is, that, is that China doesn't trust the rule of law on this thing here. But in all other issues, as I mentioned, it, it, it did a paper about the Arctic in January, and I I name-checked through it, and there were 19 references to how everybody must adhere to the UNCLOS and international law when it comes to the Arctic, but not here, because this is their backyard. I think China might be better off to actually state its Monroe Doctrine, like, like the US did in 1825, and said anybody that interferes with our backyard uh, or tries to influence our backyard more than that will, will come up against us. Anywhere else in, in the world is fine. It needs to state its case more clearly because at the moment it's losing it. Yeah, I have so I have some observations. So in so every like China has like a, a lot of countries have their own nationalist realities, but you also hear a, a different strand in a lot of diplomatic and uh, public pol like foreign policy circles is that it's a civilizational state. Uh, it has a sense of history sometimes, which uh, the European context of like having a strict Machiavellian sense is not applicable in Asia. So I he like hear these points, then I see the extension of the uh, U.S. Pacific Command up to the Indo-Pacific Command, um, and then I see in the th like coming 20, 30, 40 year horizon, the big powers will be like India, China, and U.S. So what? do you think is the potential for the international law uh, in terms of like engaging these three countries? Because on the economic front, India seems to be more aligned with China, 
but on the polit the military or the diplomatic stance it's more in line with us so it's a very curious uh, state i would say uh, in india is in a uh, that sort of fascinating position that we that, that was apparent in 1971 you know whereby and then during the cold war it was it was seen as a, a as an enemy but it was this huge democracy um India, I, India's in an interesting position. I mean, because India has failed as a, as a huge power, India has failed to project power. So over the past 10 years, probably more, 15 years, you can do, uh, it has lost influence in an area that it should have influence. So it's lost in Sri Lanka, it's lost in, well, Maldives, it might be getting it back because they just had an election, but it was losing in Maldives. It's losing in Nepal, it's losing in Bhutan, as we saw, saw up there. And it doesn't have the respect of, its, of that region. Uh, the South SARC, the South Asian Association of Countries there, it never really got off the ground because India didn't quite know how to play, play its role. Its defense strategy is wobbly. Um, so they talk now about a quad, which is India, Australia, um, Japan, and the US as being this sort of balance against China. And India wants to be part of that, but it will never be that rock-hard ally. Uh, and, and, and everybody knows that. It's much, much happier with its sort of non-aligned, chaotic democracy. Um, and if you go, to, I'm sure you know, I mean, if you go to India, I mean, there was a time a few years back where there was an obsession with China. You know, why can't we do this? Why can't we have the roads? Why can't we have the skyscrapers? They say, well, we have democracy. And they say, well, poetry is fine, but it doesn't actually feed you. Um, but I just think that, you know, this is, this is the way it's going to be. So Trump saying this is the Indo-Pacific obviously wants to draw India into this arc. I have a feeling that it may succeed in doing this, not militarily, but by showing that India has a million different voices saying a million different things. You could also have the Asian countries saying a million different things, the million different voices. And we had just a, a couple of weeks ago the president of Nauru, 11, that population 11,000, giving a rap over the knuckles to the Chinese delegate uh, for being bullying and arrogant and rude. And then you have Mahathir of Malaysia, age 93, coming back yet again, uh, cancelling these debt-ridden projects. Uh, we had Pakistan, which is a key ally of India, just, I think, a couple of days ago, criticizing China about what it was doing in Xinjiang. So I got a feeling that India could be a symbol or an example of what happens, although it doesn't do anything, you know, it doesn't send out aircraft carriers and that sort of thing. I hope that answers your question, but India is a complex one. Yeah. Can you draw a parallel between uh, the South China Sea and BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, in uh, terms of uh, Chinese uh, expansion? Yes. Um, the BRI was one of those black elephants in the room, isn't it? We call it the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's actually, depending who you talk to, a recolonization or neo-colonizing initiative, and we're feeling, the, feeling it in Europe, too. Uh, yeah, the parallel is, firstly, Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, both started on his watch. Um, it is locking in uh, Chinese supply chains, trade routes, uh, all of that sort of stuff, and Chinese influence. So you have the, the building up of the military, particularly the Navy, the designing of missiles, new warships, and that sort of thing. You have the Belt and Road Initiative that is, uh, you know, they say it's the Belt and Road Initiative across Asia, but it's been going on for decades. This has just encapsulated what it's doing. So you've got it in Latin America, where I think the New York Times had a big piece today about where they've actually got bases and military stuff in Latin America. You've got the Caribbean, you've got uh, Asia, of course, um, Africa, you know, it's well known. And at some stage, or even now, this is all coming together, isn't it, into, into the, you know, at what stage will this be a real superpower Cold War thing, or what stage will they, they come to grips with it? I mean, the Belt and Road particularly is that um, in Greenland, I mean, does anybody ever think about Greenland? No. It's this big block of ice. 
So um, last year, the Chinese were stopped by the Danish government. The Danish government controls the, the, the foreign policy of Greenland uh, for buying a military base there. Uh, because Greenland is, uh, is a key strategic element to the North Atlantic. We're way out of the Pacific now. Why on earth would the China want a military base or a, a port in Greenland? But that was stopped, not out of any sort of um, mercantile thing. It was stopped because of a strategic element. They've got the biggest embassy of any country in Iceland. They have a thing called the 16 plus 9, which is 16 of the poorer and weaker democracies in, um, in Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. These are the new democracies that come, 16 plus 9, whereby they are pouring money into Belt and Road infrastructure style projects in these, and the head of, the sort of leading, the symbolic leader of that is Viktor Orban of Hungary, who just got voted in with a landslide right-wing election that is writing a manifesto about illiberal democracy, which is basically elected authoritarianism bankroll by Chinese money. So to answer your question, yes, <laughs> it's completely interlinked in my view, yeah. Uh, just to follow up on your previous uh, comment about sort of how some of the smaller countries here are uh, pushing back against China. And one thing that, that a number of people I've talked to from either Southeast Asia or for example, Nepal, uh, talk about the rise of China is that they like it because they can use it as a counterbalance if they play things well against other regional powers. So in the case of Nepal, it would be balancing it against India. Um, for some uh, people in Africa I've talked to, it's about balancing it against the, China, uh, the US. That kind of comes up in Canada as well. Uh, so I'm just wondering from your perspective, rather than looking at it from the perspective of China or the larger countries. How do you see Southeast Asia or other countries looking at this as the rise of China and China coming into these kinds of issues as um, you know, how they're using that in their own strategic approach to balancing the, the large, big world powers? Uh, yeah, uh, Asia is a sort of group has been hugely disappointing strategically. Uh, so <clears throat> it has had, certainly since the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, uh, what was it, 40, 50 years, to form a cohesive group of countries and to put out its own values of what Asia is, so that when a rising power, whether it's the US or China, comes in and says, we're going to do it this way, they can say, no, we're going to do it the Asian way. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore was probably the, the, the sort of had the intellectual bedrock of that when he had his Asian values thing backed up by Mahathir when they were running those two and they created the Asian Tigers and that, that Asian values are different to Western values, so don't tell us who to lock up and how to run our press. Uh, but Asia's failed to do that. They started off with something called PATO, I think, then they had the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization that lasted about three or four years. But this was a, uh, this was a Western-led thing. So you had Britain and Australia and the US signed up to it, uh, but you only had Thailand and the Philippines signed up to it, and it essentially collapsed. That then went into ASEAN, which is good to stop these countries fighting each other but it's not so good to actually creating a, the front that's needed uh, to stop this, this thing. So what the situation at the moment in Asia is that they don't want to have to choose again between two superpowers. Now, we talk about the Cold War here a lot because sitting in Vancouver or sitting in London, it was a Cold War. But it wasn't a Cold War if you were in Vietnam or if you were in Cambodia or if you were in Korea. The Asian people know what Cold War means. It's a euphemism for their wars getting hot. And they're pretty determined to try to stop it, but they don't know how. So on the South China Sea issue, for example, the Cambodia is bought and paid for by Beijing, so uh, ASEAN can't come up with a, you know, or it had, I think some years back it had something, Cambodia vetoed it, and, uh, and it didn't happen. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you've got a situation whereby 
you're crying out for help, but the two people that want to help you are on opposite sides of the fence. So you're going to have to choose one or the other. And you don't want to do that, and you're complaining that you don't want to do it, but you're not talking to Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, South Korea, Japan. None of these people have got multilateral treaties. The, the defense treaties from Asia all go back to the Pentagon. So you've got the Philippines, you've got Thailand, you've got South Korea, and you've got Japan. These are not between each other. They're all going back to Washington. Until Asia can get its act together, as it were, and change that, I think you've got a problem. And if you, if you take what happened in the South China Sea a couple of days ago with that standoff there, take what's happening with the Belt and Road, um, which uh, as more and more countries are having to decide their economic benefits against standing up to China, like I showed you in the, the Philippine thing, uh, y y you have a huge conundrum. So my question is uh, also continuation of this, and partially you have addressed it, but uh, apart from the international law playing the both sides and everything, uh, how much do you think China's investment in places like, for example, you just said Vietnam originally had this war museum and removed everything because of the Chinese investment or maybe military might, I don't know which one. But I know that, for example, in many of these countries along, uh, including the BRI uh, kind of countries, China has massive investment. Like India has been reluctant to receive it, but Nepal has received it, Sri Lanka has received many um, uh, trade kind of like uh, incentives from China. China has built infrastructure there, the same as Vietnam, the same as Thailand. Not only infrastructure, but also we see that, for example, Jingdong, Alibaba, all these ones, they are investing massively in these countries, uh, basically uh, internet of things and everything else. So how much do you think this China's investment, not just military might, but Chinese investment, can actually turn the table and make these countries all actually removing this uh, black swan or elephant in the room? Um, yeah. Uh, it, it depends on what happens on the diplomatic and strategic front. Oh, sorry, one adding, just yeah. also with the fact that Trump now is playing... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got the trade war. So I think, I think when I, you know, if, um, I think, let, let's take a scenario, I mean, it, it's, it's such a, let's take a scenario whereby the trade war and the freedom of navigation operations go together. There are voices in Beijing, and we know this has happened, telling Xi Jinping to ramp it down a bit. We're not ready yet, let's wait 10 or 20 years, we can't afford to have the sort of confrontation that we're heading towards. Let's assume that happens. Then I think that's going to be a good thing. Because instead of the, the US from afar will be that sort of you know, rule maker, but apart from everything else can go on. So then the, you know, the Indian, uh, China, the Vietnam stuff, all of that stuff, which is necessary. So with the Philippines, uh, the Benigno Aquino, who was the precursor to, um, uh, to Duterte, he described China, he, uh, he likened China to the Nazi regime, and he, he was the one that took it to the, the permanent court of arbitration. And during that period, you would be a, a, a farmer in the Philippines shipping your mangoes off to there, and suddenly you would find that they were stopped for custom regulations and they wouldn't get through, and you didn't know how to, how to factor your business in. And this is the sort of, sort of leverage that China has now on, uh, you know, Cambodia, little Cambodia, probably the most corrupt country in the world, or certainly in Asia, uh, is throwing out the US military for this, that, and the other because China is building sports stadium and all the, all the rest of it. At some stage, that will have to level out. Uh, I don't, you see that the, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the U.S. has gone for, was one of those sort of catalytic infuriators that China came across as, how come we're not involved in this? How come we've de been deliberately excluded from this? Uh, so, and that was the century of humiliation again. But on the other hand, they've got the Asian Infrastructure Bank that matches all World Bank stuff, and they exchange surveys and that. So I think we're on a cusp now. If something happens in the South China Sea, if something happens over Taiwan, if something happens over the Xinjiang repression that's going on at the moment, and that moves like a prairie fire into the US Congress, then you get the black and white that you saw in that North Korea picture. 
and everything stops. If it's more nuanced and China goes in realizing, yeah, it can do these deals with Vietnam, it can do Sri Lanka, but it mustn't build its ports there, it doesn't threaten them, it, it is not whatever. What it's done that we didn't achieve, the US didn't achieve, no colonizer, if you want to, no expander of power has achieved is that it's got this far without a shot being fired in anger. There are clever people in Beijing, and, and I understand, and you, some of you might know better, is that over the past two months, Xi Jinping has come in for a lot of flack from its, his own people for being too aggressive, and, uh, and, 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 and might have drawn back again. But it's this balance. And in my experience, as you go through these things, those balances fall apart. So it fell apart in the, um, after the decolonization of Vietnam. It fell apart in Iraq. It fell apart in Libya. So, you know, I think it is quite dangerous. Hi, thank you. My name is Yoshi Kawasaki. I'm a professor here. This is the topic I do research on and teach. Uh, my question is about uh, Britain. I'm curious because the how would you uh, describe uh, British government approach or perspective or British military approach, particularly Navy, which now is sending ship to this part of the world. So I'm just curious if you could tell us uh, a little bit about how you uh, see British attitude or environment. Thank you. Um, you probably know we don't really have a functioning government in Britain at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and you, you, you will know that we had, what, three or four years ago, we had this golden era with China that was created by our former finance minister, George Osborne. And in that golden era, China would come in and run our nuclear power networks, our, uh, our trains, our airports, and all the rest of it. And then we had a... I'll tell you this through a story, okay? Instead of... Uh, is that when I was researching this book, I, I, I became quite good friends. Not that you ever become friends with a Chinese diplomat that's official like that, but I came, quite good friends. Uh, and he was briefing me and helping me on this. And then we had an issue... Uh, with a nuclear power station called Hinkley Point, that the Chinese uh, were going to be uh, part of the investments with the French and the British. And a signing ceremony was due. Uh, so the, uh, the, the canopies had been prepared, the champagne was chilled, the mem memorandums of understanding were out there, the planes were flying in and the hotel rooms were booked. And we had a, a referendum on something that had nothing to do with any of that. It was on, 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 uh, it was on Brexit. And that thing got delayed or cancelled. And this guy gives me a call. He never calls me. I always had to drag him out. He gives me a call. I go around to the embassy. They have various people taking notes and recording things and filming things. And he says, um, he says I just, uh, what's going on with Hinkley Point, Humphrey, he says. And I say, well, you know as much as I do. He said, yes, but you know how your country thinks. And I said, well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'll wing it for a bit. And he says, but I just want to understand this. He says, you have this, this vote on something about Europe, and the prime minister resigns. I said, yes. And another prime minister takes over without a big vote. I say, yes, that's right. Uh, and she was uh, in the same government as this other person that gave this Hinkley Point thing. I said, yes. And she would know all about it because she was in cabinet. I said, yes. And he said, and she comes in, and then she looks at it, and then she then threatens to cancel it and throw us out. And I said, yes. And he says, uh, and you're meant to be a great trading nation. And I said, yes. He says, is this really how a great Western democratic trading nation works? <laughs> and I said, yes, I guess it is. And he put his head in his hands like this, as if, thank God I come from a sensible country where you can predict <laughs> elements like that. So I hope that answers your question a bit. We, we no longer have the golden era, but nobody's torn it up, so it could be resurrected tomorrow. Uh, we, there is a big pushback in Europe, uh, including in the UK, but led by Germany, against Chinese investment. Uh, the European Union at the end of 2018 that we're coming to is going to launch a, a scrutineering thing about deals that become suspect, but it has no power to stop them. 
the Three Gorges Company uh, had a plan and a bid to, to, to buy the main Portuguese energy company, and that was stopped by the Portuguese government. Uh, I told you about the Denmark element there. Uh, we, have, uh, we have no such law about this, and I think that we might at some stage have it. But we had a situation whereas in 2003, British Telecom, which is our critical infrastructure telecommunication system, signed with Huawei, which is now the big, huge thing, to embed its software in our critical infrastructure without telling anybody or referring to government. Um, and that situation, although we're assured in that nod-wink style that Britain works without actually anything being explained that it's all okay on the night, um, that is, uh, it, it, it is a troubling thing. So they, they're now bidding for our high speed, new high-speed railway. They're in the Hinkley Point thing back there. They own 10% of Heathrow Airport, 20% of Manchester Airport, 10% of Thames Water, and the rest of it. Similarly in Europe, um, of which I think there's going to begin to be pushback. You mentioned mainly uh, north of the equator. Have you ever investigated anything that's going on in uh, the South Pacific? You know, like Vanuatu, where they've gone and they built a huge uh, convention centre, and the workers were brought from China. And one of the conditions was that they're allowed to live there, and then. Uh, I guess expand that way, and there's other places where they're setting up fishing, uh, or I guess bases, and so they, and even I think I've read somewhere where there's interest in the Antarctic as well. Mm -hmm. So have you ever investigated any of that at all? Um, the Australia thing I mentioned, the Australians were the first one to sort of point out the South China Sea problem. New Zealand it has been their guinea pig. So if you look at the, I. I haven't yet got a graph. If you look at the inward investment into New Zealand compared to any other Western democratic country in the world, it is enormous. And their population in New Zealand is, what, about six million? And it was their guinea pig to see what, what would happen. Australia, uh, similarly, although Australia is, is, is bigger. And these, these are these two Western democracies that have got a problem because they are intricately entwined in the Asia-Pacific economy, unlike Britain, say, or even the US, uh, yet they are tied into the intelligence, strategic, and military network of the West. So Australia is, is sending stuff back. It, too, is pushing back against... And there's been a very good book written recently where they've got the Sydney Opera House draped in a Chinese flag saying, what are we going to do there? The South Pacific is interesting because... Um, these are small countries which can be easily manipulated like Greenland. And I think there was a plan to build a, a base in Vanuatu. And the US and Australia are now planning to build a base in Papua New Guinea to offset all that up there. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about the Nauru story that I said is that Nauru is a, one government that is bankrolled or recognizes Taiwan. So. It doesn't have to rely, it's only 11,000 people, so Taiwan can pay for, for an area. It doesn't have to rely on Chinese, uh, Chinese stuff. Um, so th the Pacific is a place where, yeah, they could put a base, but I think there'll be a lot of pushbacks. You've got Australia, now you've got New Zealand, you've got the US, uh, and you've got <laughs> countries like Nauru that are going to say, you know, go away. Just an interesting after thing on that Nauru thing is that there were three Latin American countries that withdrew their recognition of Taiwan since June. Uh, Panama, uh, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic. About a month ago, uh, the US withdrew their amb it, its ambassadors from those countries as a message to any other country, if they think about withdrawing support from Taiwan, that they will actually meet the wrath of the United States. So this is, you know, there are all this sort of stuff, and I think for, in the Pacific, which is, um, I, I don't, I, some of them, I, I've got a slide, you, you know that great um, the statue outside the Pentagon of the Marines putting the flag up in Iajima. Yeah. When people say to me, um, well, who's going to fight, I, I ask that question, who's going to fight over these, these rocks? Well, you know, that is the symbol of, of the US Marines fighting over uninhabited, sparse inhabited territory in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Pacific, against a rising power. So don't think it's not going to happen with China. Mm. 
Yes, I, I'm from Malaysia originally, and uh, all my education uh, was in England, so I'm not China, China. Now, uh, the way I look at it, since uh, over 50 years of my knowledge and uh, of politics and all that, <clears throat> is that, first of all, looking at your map, uh, I've got news that China has gone into bilateral discussions with every country because it's such a complex situation. I was involved at one time in the fisheries law and uh, the law of the sea conference. That was 40 years ago. That didn't work, did it? So I think the international law in a complex situation may not work. Now, uh, so China has already talked about bilateral discussions with every country, and I don't know where that went. However, the other point is China wants to protect the, the shipping routes because over 90% of trade of these container ships belong to China. So it's quite natural that they would like to protect it. Can you imagine the US embargo goes and, and just shut up the, the, the trade uh, because of tariffs and whatever? They cannot have that. Now, uh, so that's the other aspect of it. I'm not justifying or being an apologist for China, but the reality is, as what this gentleman said, if they've got huge investments in Africa, Sri Lanka, everywhere, we have to accept the fact that one day they would have tried to protect their investments, maybe through military means like in Africa. And China has been building roads like nobody's business in Africa. Now you can travel from South Africa right up to Egypt. The entire road is built by China. So they make, like what the British has done to Malaysia and elsewhere, they make uh, transportation easy to facilitate trade. Of course, in Britain, they just plunder, as you know. They plunder <laughs> India, they plunder every country as a colonialist. But those days are over. The Japanese tried that, okay? Emperor Hirohito came out and caused untold misery to all of Asia. But today, Emperor Akihito, the son, goes out and apologizes for the father's doings. And that's the reality. So we, on our side, we've endured all those things. We mean big and Asian. And uh, let the things pass. Now, my problem is looking at the present world with Trump, who is just a, a joker to everybody. It's very unstable. He's, he's today in love with uh, Kim Jong-un, as we all know. They are in love, okay? Now, three months, six months ago, you were saying... Your love is tough at the moment, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but three months ago, he would want to go and bomb out North Korea. Three, well, I think it's three to six months ago. So, you have a mercurial, unpredictable character, who is now the president of the US, I don't know for how long, who has, who has broken every law against women, against immigrants, against Muslims, you name it, he has done all of that. And he still survived, just because some 30% of Americans would like to be ruled by a dictator. Can I just address your, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right about, uh, British plundering and all the rest of it, because we address that. With it. But just to address your point about Trump, because it's an interesting one. I'm often asked whether Asia is, is safer or less safe under Trump or Obama. Uh, and I don't think it was safe under Obama, because I was tracking stuff. They were heading towards this sort of thing. Nothing was going on. What is interesting about Trump is that he makes people think. So when I mentioned about taking the call from the president of Taiwan, and questioning the one China policy. Nobody had done that for 40 years. So the think tanks and the diplomats and everybody had to think, okay, what happens? Talk about bombing North Korea. 
every time I, in my career uh, that I had covered North Korea, they said, well, you know, you couldn't bomb it because Seoul would be destroyed within half an hour. But he says, well, why can't we bomb it? So making people think, pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, okay? And I'm not saying whether these are good or bad things, but what I'm saying is that, is that he's coming at a sort of a deadlocked situation with a number of things that is, that is wondering how we could fix this. So on the Trans-Pacific Partnership element, uh, where he pulled out of this great big, you know, pan-Asian Pacific deal, is that in a way it removed the United States from being the blame boy for Asia and the world. So at the height of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you had that Japanese Sino stuff going on that I mentioned there. When he pulled out, you all the fishing boats and the warships that were confronting each other around those Senkaku Islands suddenly melted away. Because these two powers in Asia knew that if the US did pull out, they had to make it work. They couldn't go back to war because if they went back to war, China would be blamed for doing what Japan had done in the 1930s. So in a way, you know, the stuff is still going on, but I, I think it's quite interesting to look at the result of what Trump has done, is doing, without that sort of, okay, he, he's dreadful with women and he does this and that. Let's just do it as, okay, he's, he's asking questions that he doesn't even want to know the answer to because he hasn't got that attention span, but he's asking those questions because he is the President of the United States. Um, and uh, and I, I think, I mean, essentially, if China wants to win this whole thing over the next... 50 or 100 years, the countries of Asia need to feel safe. That includes Japan, it includes India, it includes Cambodia, Vanuatu, and Nauru. And at the moment, they don't. So up in Beijing, those people that are railing against Xi Jinping are telling him this. And then if you take back the other point I made is they've achieved what they've done so far without a shot being fired in anger, and they are clever people up there. I think you've got stuff that might work. Ah. <laughs> So let me come back and ask the question that how do you see China evolving? Because um, I think at a tech talk, talk uh, a lady from Zambia said that now the China model is becoming the preferred model for emerging economies. And she did a correlation to say that if your economy of a GDP of less than eight or nine thousand dollars, you can't afford liberal democracy. Okay? But you need to get up to that level. Then he, she said that you look at South Korea, you look at Taiwan, and all of these countries went from dictatorship or authoritarian government towards liberal democracy when the economic uh, capacity reached a certain point. Now China is getting very close to that 8,000, 9,000 per capita GDP. Where do you see China's political system evolving as a result of the economic prosperity that's been injected into the country, the education that's been injected to throughout the whole country? People think for themselves anymore. So how will you see China evolving in the next 20 years? The, the figure I put on that is the Taiwanese figure because it's a Chinese society that did exactly what you said. And in 1985, the GDP per capita was 5,000 which I think in Chinese terms today equates to 17,000. And it was at that stage that they realized the pact between the citizen and the government and the property owners and the education uh, was at that sort of confluence level whereby you could loosen things up. Now, of course, it's not going to be an exact mirror. Uh, and also China has loosened up a lot anyway and is now clamping down again. But... One of the interesting things about the Opium Museum that I went to is that in the description of the technology on that right-hand side, there was the word democracy used twice. And this is a, a government-owned museum. I think you're absolutely right, is that we in the West, I'm not, actually I won't count myself, but those idiots in the governments in the West thought they could go into Iraq and thought that if they got rid of one man, remember I talked about them person, they one man, Take him away, this panoply of huge 
fair, just institutions would drop down and you would have a non-corrupt judiciary and a non-corrupt police force and fire service and education thing and that God knows how they ever thought that. But that was the view that was going through the Bush administration at the time. I'm not sure we've learnt that lesson because we thought the same thing we could do with Assad, we thought the same thing with Libya, I'm not sure. Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan yeah. Um, sure. But, and just to address your point about the, 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 the model, is that, yeah, as long as the, the wealth goes down, we in the West still think in this black and white terms about dictatorship and democracy. But since, um, since the end of the Soviet Union, the past 25 years in Zambia, for example, and the Chinese have come in and they've built the roads and they've built the bridges and they've built the airports, whereas what did we do with the World Bank? We went into a village and that village needed a bridge over a stream to get the children to hospital or a school. We would only build that bridge if they had carried out gender disparity, had enough elections, done this and done that. So the bridge never got built. And that's why we've lost that model, because China has succeeded in dragging its people out of poverty, whereas those, in, like in India, we were talking about, a child in India born, I think, has got five times more chances of dying in its first year of life than a child in China. Why is that? Because they, they have been, had this democratic model where the individual voice is supreme, whereas China is where the voice of the community is supreme. And that is the battle of ideas that's going on at the moment. Sure. Uh, sure. I'll, uh, I'm not sure if I'm even formulating the, the question uh, right, but uh, um, I, I guess I, I kind of see... So in more simplistic terms, you know, there's a playground with 194, 195 kids, right? And for the last 100 years or so, there's really eight dominant kids who are playing together. Okay. And, and um, you know, one is rising. And it's not even sort of force that's coming. It's, it, he's here. And there's a Chinese kid who's, who's really, really powerful and making a lot of money and, and is... is uh, imposing their will, you know, in, w amongst these kids playing together. And I, and it, it's timely that there's a, you're researching this, there's Trump that's backlashing because uh, the, this Chinese kid is doing something that's bothering everybody, right? And, and innately, we all want to be number one. We all want, want to fight and we all want, we, all, we all want to eat more. We all want to have better things. And, and, that, and that guy is here. And so, you know, what would be a better way uh, to include this person, to include China here? Do you respectfully invite them in, or do you collectively try to bully and push them down? Look at all, all the black swans and everything together. What, what, you know, based on your research, what would be the most effective way to include this new entrant? I, I think you've nailed it, and in, in this lady here, the, 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 the question we answered there is that you, you, have to, you have to change the UN. And you can't because the Security Council is locked, or the permanent members are. Those members that could have come up, like India and Brazil, on, they've rotated on the Security Council, and, and UN people I know say they didn't really make their mark. Like, they didn't say, oh, we're here, you should let us in. So I think, you know, you've got a problem there, a big problem. And I'll just finish with this, is that two of those members of the Security Council are fake. Okay, because we think it's those with nuclear weapons. That's not the case. Actually, they're, they're meant to be the victors of the Second World War. But again, this was corrupt horse trading because Britain wanted Brazil to be in there and, and it was vetoed by whatever. But France didn't win the Second World War and nor did China. So what the hell are they doing on there anyway? Anyway, I'll leave you on that. <laughs>